The world's decision makers had assembled in Munich for a security conference. And after long hours of negotiation, late into the night, announced a deal. 17 states and three international organizations signed off on it, but in essence, it's a Russian and American plan. Our work today, while it has produced commitments on paper, uh, I want to restate the real test is clearly whether or not all the parties honor those commitments and implement them in reality. The agreement sets up an international humanitarian task force, lists places where aid needs to go now, notes humanitarian access should not benefit any particular group over any other. It calls for a cessation of hostilities in one week's time, the 19th of February, with another task force to agree the boundaries of who holds what territory in Syria and then the resumption of peace talks as soon as possible in Geneva. The 25th of February is the hoped-for date, we hear. Does this provide a real hope for peace? Earlier I spoke exclusively to the leader of Syria's opposition umbrella group. The battle for Aleppo continued today with the Syrian army warning of imminent further assaults and its leader bullish after recent successes. If we negotiate, it does not mean that we will stop fighting terrorism. Two tracks are inevitable in Syria. First, through negotiation, and second, through fighting terrorism. And the two tracks are separate from each other. As for the president himself, his future is central to the political transition envisaged in today's agreement. But even if the Americans now see Assad staying on for a while, the opposition insists he cannot. لا يمكن للأسد أن يكون له أي دور في مستقبل سوريا ولا حتى من بدء المرحلة الانتقالية هذا الكلام خمس سنوات والشعب السوري يناضل من أجل هذه المسألة وقدم مئات الآلاف من الشهداء ومئات الآلاف من المعتقلين والملايين السوريين الآن موجودين خارج سوريا نتيجة إجرام هذا النظام وتمسكه في كرسي الحكم بمساعدة حلفائه من الإيرانيين وروس فكيف يمكن أن يبقى بشار الأسد في السلطة وفعل ما فعله في سوريا؟ The Assad regime offensive backed by the Russians from the air, spearheaded by Iranian and other volunteers on the ground, began getting real traction three months ago southeast of Aleppo. Early this year, rebels were driven back in the Assad heartland of Latakia province. And recently, the so-called Azaz Corridor north of Aleppo has been cut. Under today's deal, the Al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front and Islamic State will still be attacked, but will more moderate groups too. They've got the potential to be a very important breakthrough, but it all depends now on the behaviour of the Russians. If the Russians carry on bombing the moderate opposition, then this will not deliver the outcome we want. So today aims for a ceasefire, but only between certain people. Even if it works, Russia, America and others will still be taking aim at the Islamic State and Nusra Front. The Syrian warring groups are not actually party to today's agreement. Instead, those who did sign are meant to deliver them. Iran and Russia, the Assad government, and the US, Europe and the Gulf states, the various opposition groups. That'll involve a lot of behind the scenes pressure and talking to opposition leaders, it's apparent they already resent that. As Munich ends, 
there's a sober realisation that this will be very tough. But they are already working on speeding up humanitarian aid to besieged communities, and that at least could be something.